Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you for taking the time to attend our webinar today. Uh, my name is Melissa Morford, and I'm a neuro resource facilitator here with the Brain Injury Alliance of Iowa. Uh, and before we begin today's webinar, I just wanted to go over a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, as you will see on your GoToWebinar control panel, you do have two options for listening today. We have a mic and speakers option or a telephone option. So if you're having any trouble listening uh, with either of the options, just go ahead and try and switch out to the other option to see if that helps at all. Uh, we will be recording this webinar today and we'll have it archived on our Brain Injury Alliance of Iowa website in the coming days. Uh, that web address for any of those of you who would like to access that is www.biaia.org. Uh, we will also save a few minutes here at the end of our session today for any questions that you may have. Please feel free to go ahead and utilize the chat box for this on your control panel and I will help to read through those questions at the end. No CEUs will be provided for this webinar today, but a certificate of attendance will be sent out to all registrants following this session. Now, I would like to go ahead and introduce our guest speakers today. Our first presenter is Dr. Scott Lindgren. Uh, Dr. Lindgren is a pediatric neuropsychologist and professor of pediatrics in the University of Iowa Children's Hospital and the Carver College of Medicine. He holds a BA from Yale University and a PhD in clinical psychology from the University of Iowa. Uh, he completed postdoctoral fellowship at Harvard Medical School in Boston Children's Hospital. His current clinical teaching and research activities are focused on child neuropsychology, brain injuries, autism spectrum disorders, disability and health, and the prevention of disabilities. He has published extensively in the areas of developmental disabilities, brain injury, learning disorders, ADHD, and neurobehavioral functioning associated with prematurity and chronic health conditions. Dr. Lindgren is Associate Director for Program Development for Iowa's University Center for Excellence on Disabilities and is the Psychology Training Director for Iowa's Leadership Education in Neurodevelopmental Disabilities Program. Dr. Lindgren is co-director of the UI Children's Hospital Autism Center and also directs the University of Iowa activities that are part of Iowa's HRSA Traumatic Brain Injury Implementation Partnership Program, which is a collaboration with the Iowa Department of Public Health, the Brain Injury Alliance of Iowa, and other TBI partners. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Lindgren. And our second presenter here today is Dr. Valerie Kuhl. Dr. Kuhl is a pediatric neuropsychologist who serves children with brain injuries and other neurodevelopmental disabilities at the Center for Disabilities and Development in the University of Iowa Children's Hospital. Dr. Kuhl holds a BS in psychology and a PhD in school psychology from the University of Iowa. He has experience providing neuropsychological assessments and consultations for both inpatient and outpatient neurotrauma rehabilitation. Dr. Kuhl has published research focused on neuropsychological effects of childhood cancer and HIV infections in children with hemophilia, and she has substantial experience coordinating a statewide consultation program for children with brain injuries who experience problems in learning or behavior in school. She has also coordinated the development of a series of brain injury training materials, including online video modules focused on optimizing a student's ability to return to learn after a traumatic brain injury. In addition to her ongoing clinical responsibilities at the CDD, she currently provides consultation and training on brain injury throughout the state as part of Iowa's HRSA Traumatic Brain Injury Implementation Partnership Program. Thank you for, to Dr. Kuhl for joining us. And without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to uh, Dr. Lindgren and Dr. Kuhl. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes, yeah, yes we can. Can you hear right. us? I can hear you just fine, so I'll go ahead and turn it over to you guys, okay? Thanks, Melissa. Thank you. Yeah, and thanks for inviting us to be with you today. Um, as you can tell from the, the title that's up on the screen, we're going to be talking about concussion today. We're going to talk about the effects, the impact of sudden impact to the brain. And we want to help you understand those effects, both uh, the cognitive, behavioral, and physical functioning. Uh, I, think, I think we've already mentioned several of the, the projects that uh, we've been involved in in brain injury uh, in Melissa's introduction. Um, we're, we're certainly uh, uh, glad to be partnering with the Department of Public Health and with several other partners, including the Brain Injury Alliance of Iowa, in, in trying to improve the infrastructure for Iowa uh, regarding 
traumatic brain injury, especially things like concussion. And we, we don't have any other financial relationships to disclose today. What we'd like you to be able to do um, after listening to us today and, and some of the resources we present to you is to un understand the effects of concussion on learning, memory, executive functions, behavior, emotions, and physical functioning. We'd also like to have you be able to recognize how the effects of a concussion may change at different ages and stages of development. We hope that you'll learn how to design individualized interventions and accommodations to manage the real life impact of concussions. And related to that, we want to uh, focus on some effective strategies for helping children and youth return to learn and return to play after a concussion. And, and returning to the cognitive aspects of learning uh, is certainly a part of the return to play uh, as we'll be discussing a little bit later. Well, what I want to do first actually is, is present a, a short video. It's, a, it's about 10 minutes long. It provides a really nice review of, of some of the issues that come up in recognizing and managing the effects of concussion. And I, I think it's, a, it's also a good review of uh, some of the issues that were discussed in the first webinar in this series. And so we'll, we'll go ahead and play that, and then we'll have a chance after that. Uh, uh, Val and I will uh, be discussing some of the issues that uh, we, we hope you've summarized uh, pretty quickly in, in uh, Dr. Mike's presentation because he talks really fast, even faster than I'm talking right now. All right, let's see if we can get this to work. Hi, my name is Dr. Mike Evans, and this is a quick review of concussions, what they are and what to do. Now, you may have watched our Concussion 101 video, and this is just an updated version that covers even more. Concussions have got a lot of press. I think we can all now name a player or, or a friend that has had one. And I think we tend to hear about the bad cases. But I think it's also important to know that a concussion can be well managed by you and your family, your school, and your care team. The first thing you need to know about concussions is that they're like your other injuries, and they're completely different. When you injure your knee, you rest initially, and you, and you see how it feels after a few days. You probably get looked at, sometimes it's something more serious, but most get better, and, and you slowly resume activity. Well, all that's true for concussions. It's, it's estimated that 80 to 90 percent of concussions resolve within three weeks. The big difference is that most people aren't used to resting their brain. There are no crunches, no ice pack, no injury that people can see. If you go way back to school, physical activity, work, digital life, it's, it's like going for a run on your injured knee. Let's start with what a concussion is. A concussion is a blow to the head or, or elsewhere in the body that shakes your head, where you have some other stuff going on. These other things tell us that your brain has been affected. Now your brain is mission control and responsible for so many things. So there are a lot of different ways a concussion can feel. We generally think of four categories. So physical problems like headaches, poor balance, being more tired, blurry vision, dizziness, sensitivity to light and noise, and so on. Next are thinking problems such as feeling mentally foggy or more slowed down with difficulty to remember or concentrate. Then there are emotional symptoms like feeling sad or, or less control of your emotions. You might feel more worried or irritable. And finally, there are sleep issues, which can work both ways. You might feel you're drowsy or, or sleeping more. Or the reverse, you may have trouble falling asleep or sleeping less. These symptoms can appear immediately or take 24 to 48 hours to happen. It's also to step back and wonder if any of these symptoms get worse when you're working harder, either physically or cognitively, when you're using your brain. Concussions can be scary at the beginning, so it might be helpful to start by making sure there isn't something more serious going on. If things take a sudden turn for the worse, for example, an unusual worsening of a headache or repeated vomiting, seizures, weakness in your arms or legs, or you seem way more out of it, slowed speech, confusion, drowsiness, or you can't be woken up, this needs to be urgently assessed. The two key words here are sudden change. Concussions don't show up on a CT or MRI scanners in the emergency room, but these tests can be useful when there is a sudden worsening coming for brain injuries other than a concussion. The reality is most concussions can be managed without going to the ER, but, but check with your doctor just to be sure. My advice is to take the first week after concussion in 24 hour chunks. Things might get a bit worse or, or better in the first 24 hours, but we tend to err on the side of caution and focus on resting the brain. This means taking time off from screens, taking it easy, no sports, and getting lots of sleep. Sleep is good for a concussion. 
again, if you injured your knee, you could probably still make it to school or work, but with a concussion, you need to rest that brain. So you may have to take a few days or even a week off. This seems like a lot, but it may pay off down the road. So speaking of the road recovery, this is hard to predict at the time of injury. Usually things get better in days or weeks, but it can also take months. There are some factors that may make your recovery stretch out a bit longer and that you need to consider in your get better strategy. For example, have you had a previous concussion, especially a recent one, or one that lasted a long time? Or is there a story of multiple concussions where it took less force to cause symptoms? If you have a history of headaches or migraines, these can worsen. If you have had some learning or mental health issues such as ADHD, anxiety, depression, a sleep disorder, a learning disability, and so on, these conditions may or may not become more of a challenge when you injure your brain. Now, as I've said, helping your brain self-repair is different. It, it might be helpful to imagine your brain like a cell phone. When you get a concussion, it's as if your baseline battery light goes down. It's just harder to recharge to 100% as a lot of your power goes to healing your brain. If we try to do all of the activities we normally do, chances are we'll run out of power quickly. And this is when we feel wet down and our post-concussion symptoms get worse. One way to conserve energy is to use the four Ps. So the first P is to prioritize our activities each day. We only want to use up our limited charge on the activities that are most important to us. The second P is to plan out which activities we're going to do and when to do them. It is best to plan difficult or important activities when you have more of a charge. So after a rest or, or on a day you don't have any other activities to do, or at a time when you feel best, could be in the morning. The third P is to pace yourself. Instead of reading a full chapter of your textbook, try reading a few pages at a time with breaks to allow your battery to recharge. And the fourth P is to position yourself in environments that won't use up extra battery. Just being in noisy and distracting environments or, or feeling stressed drains your charge. So with the four P's in mind, let's talk about return to learn and return to physical activity. Both these strategies can be modified by your unique situation, school, and, and or your healthcare professional, but they're a great starting point. Being in school makes the brain work harder, so you want to return gradually. Perspective is important here. Each of us are different in how we respond to concussions, so your recovery plan is unique and needs to be individualized. Sometimes this means taking more time, and it's important for you and your family to see this as a smart response that will get you better sooner, not a failure. We generally begin by starting with no school for a few days and getting lots of rest at home. Next is a small increase in home cognitive and physical activity with light walking, easy reading, and some screen time. A diary of your planned activities and what happened can be helpful. If you can do 30 minutes with no symptoms, you can start school-specific activity like homework in 30-minute chunks. When you can tolerate 30 minutes of school-type activity without your symptoms getting worse, with breaks to help your symptoms. Then you are ready to go back to school part-time for one to three hours a day with realistic productivity expectations. When you can do four to five hours of school activity with two to three rest breaks, you can consider a return to full-time school with supports that acknowledge the four Ps. And this may mean extra help or breaks, limited testing in a day, preferential seating, and so on. When you have no active symptoms and no problems with exertion, you can return to your regular school schedule. To make all this happen, I think it's very important to have a contact person at the school who can make staff and volunteers aware, assist in scaling your activity up or, or down, and individualizing your supports to get better. This means facilitating a collaborative team approach involving the family, doctor, school, coaches. It means education, and I think it also means paying attention and reacting to subtle signs, and, and checking meetings to discuss strategies around homework, testing, breaks, distraction-free environments, seating, access to class notes, phys ed, and, and playground planning. Returning to physical activity when you are symptom-free is a similar stage-based approach, and, and having the team on the same page is key. Step one is no activity at all. In step two, we try a lighter workout exercise like a jog. If you can do that with no symptoms, then step three is returning to your sport in a low-risk setting. So, going for a skate, kicking a soccer ball, shooting some hoops, but just by yourself or with a partner. This makes the activity more predictable and less likely you will be hit by an object or a person. Monitor yourself and see how you do. If all good and you want to return to team play, Step four is being yellow shirted for practices. Now the yellow shirt tells the other players that they cannot come into contact with you. If you remain symptom free with this high level of activity, then you can go to step five, which is full contact practice. We usually try to stretch out the stage a bit to really test for symptoms, but I think also to help the player feel confident that she or, or he is back to normal. If all goes well, but step six is your return to competition. Each step must take at least a day. And so depending on how the person does, this process can take a week, a month, or even a year. 
All this can take time and be frustrating. It's hard to slow down, and it's easy to feel down. Talking is key. It, it's so important that you're open with your parents, teachers, coaches, family, and friends, because it's hard to see concussions. People presume you're okay, so you need to be upfront about how you're feeling. Things like being in a fog or being anxious can be hard to put a finger on, so you don't need to dwell on it, but, but you do need to be clear and honest about how you're feeling. The good news is that I think the world is much more accepting of concussions. The reality is that we're still figuring out exactly the best way for each person to come back from a concussion. The data thus far suggests that people who don't let their brains rest tend to do worse, especially if they expose themselves to re-injury before they are ready. What we're still figuring out is the right balance between challenging yourself and overdoing it. We don't want you to do too much, but we also don't want you to do too little. It seems that, you know, as with other injuries, people who increase their activity gradually without triggering problems seem to do well. So take care of yourself if you have a concussion. You know, your brain is you. Everything you've got good at, your memories, how you figure things out, all that is sitting inside your brain. So keep positive, share any concerns with the people that care about you, and consult us together. And take care of that fantastic brain of yours. Thanks for listening. Well, that, that's a, a really nice summary we wanted to share with you, and, and uh, I'd encourage you to use this uh, if you have friends or colleagues who need to know more about brain injury. It's a nice, quick, accessible introduction and review, even for those people who know a bit about brain injury. But one of the things that we are always uh, focusing on is how to deal with some of the challenges of after a concussion. And, and there are really some things about concussions and other brain injuries, too, that are puzzling. Um, one of the things we know is that after uh, a concussion, uh, a, a child may be consistently inconsistent. That means they may show a skill or a behavior one day, but they're unable to do it the next day. Uh, they also may not uh, look abnormal in any way. They, they may look just like they normally do, and so sometimes teachers or, or other kids may be unaware of the impact that brain injury has had. Um, the other thing you can't really stress uh, too much is that a concussion is a brain injury. We used to think about concussions as nothing to worry about, but even though it's milder than some injuries that, that people sustain, it really is something that uh, uh, we need to pay attention to and we can't just ignore or dismiss it. We want to focus uh, with a little more detail on a, a couple of the issues that come up in the effects of a concussion. And, and we're going to talk about um, thinking, cognitive skills, uh, behavior and emotions, and some of the physical changes that can occur. In, in the area of, of uh, cognition, we're going to talk about learning, memory, and executive functions. Uh, and we're going to talk about a range of, of issues in behavior and emotions, including mood swings and social problems. and inhibition issues and mood problems. And physically, too, there, there may be changes with easier fatigue, uh, development or worsening of seizures, uh, headaches, hearing or vision problems, and, and motor problems. In the learning area, um, we, we often see inconsistencies in, in learning, feeling slowed down, having trouble reading, having difficulty thinking clearly, and, and overall just kind of feeling sluggish, hazy, or foggy. In the area of memory, uh, uh, we may see more trouble than usual in remembering things, not being able to follow a discussion or lengthy instructions, and having difficulty listening and taking notes, and also forgetting to plan for and complete assignments. I want to show you just a, a little bit of some comments by um, uh, an individual who had a uh, significant brain injury, but these also reflect many of the problems we see in, in concussion. And this guy's name is Isaiah, a great, great kid. After, after my accident, it's like, like every test, it's like I had to like have the material read to me several times a day like several days for like a couple of weeks before it became like into my long-term memory my long-term memory was not hurt it was just my short term so it's like if, if someone just told me it like in one day and then took a test over it i would not have any clue 
but it's like, like if they tell me it time and time again, like every, like several times every day, uh, for several weeks, then it becomes in my long term memory, and then I can actually remember it. Uh, I also wanted to make sure that we're sensitive to the issue of executive functions, which is a term that most of you have probably heard something about. People use it a lot, but there are different ideas of what executive functions are. But these are the functions that, that really are the way the brain uses the skills that we have. And they're particularly prone to dysfunction after a concussion or other brain injury because the frontal lobes are so vulnerable to being bounced around inside the skull. And so these can include things like trouble paying attention or concentrating, problems staying organized, problems with decision making, slowness in thinking, uh, getting lost or easily confused. And here's a, a fuller list of uh, the things that we think about as a, um, executive functions. Um, and they, they run the gamut from some of the planning and organizing things that we need to do, getting tasks started, sustaining our focus on tasks, being able to juggle things in memory to accomplish a task, uh, inhibiting inappropriate behavior, kind of checking on yourself, monitoring that, and then being aware of what's happening uh, both to you and around you, being able to think flexibly and to be able to regulate your own uh, thinking and, and motor skills. Um, those are the sort of formal things, but I, I also wanted to to focus on a simpler way of looking at executive functions. You can just think about kind of the cold, uh, rational side of, of executive functions, the cognitive side. Those are the problems with attention, planning, and judgment. We see the problems with, with those a lot after a brain injury. But there's also the, the, the hotter stuff, the, the stuff that gets everybody into trouble. And, and uh, those kinds of behaviors include uh, problems with self-control and being disinhibited, which we we see uh, after uh, some brain injuries. And, and Val's going to talk next about um, some of the issues that we do see in terms of behaviors after concussions and, and other brain injuries. So I'm going to shift over to Val right here. Thank you, Scott. Here's a list of many of the common behaviors that we see after a student has had a concussion. Some of these have already been talked about. You can see that some of them are parts of executive functioning. Some of them look like different characteristics of kids with ADHD. The estimate for problem behaviors, even up to a year post-injury, is that about a third of the kids who have a mild traumatic brain injury or concussion will still be in that category of having general irritability. And even longer over time, we'll see that the behavior and psychosocial problems negatively influence quality of adult life far more than the intellectual or the physical problems. And I think that's a, a key for us to keep in mind. And over time, we may see that behavior problems get worse as the kiddo gets older because in school they're having increasing academic demands, there are increasing expectations for kids to have self-regulated behavior, and they may just be getting more frustrated. That frustration can be from having poor school performance, being isolated socially, or having restrictions on activities. And as we heard from Dr. Mike earlier, I hope you enjoyed that video, we thought he was great. Um, challenging behavior can arise from different kinds of physical problems, the fatigue, headaches, or dizziness. It can also come from emotional problems such as depression, anxiety, or irritability. And it can also be affected by characteristics that the student has prior to the injury. So for instance, if they have a diagnosis of ADHD or depression, it's also important for us to remember that how we in the environment respond to the student and their learning needs or behavior is also going to have a big impact on their behavior. So in, in, uh, just to summarize a little bit, challenging behavior can arise from deficits in cognition, from executive functioning deficits that were mentioned earlier. And we want to always remember to look also 
at the function of the student's behavior and ask what is their behavior communicating. Oftentimes with kids with brain injury, it is communicating that they want to escape or avoid something because it's too difficult or overwhelming. They also may just simply be wanting to get attention or obtain something. For a lot of kids with concussion, they also may be wanting to reduce or increase sensory stimulation or express negative feelings. When we're managing challenging behaviors with kids with brain injury and concussion, we want to think about how to prevent the problems. We want to use antecedent rather than consequence-based approaches. We want to focus on setting up that environment to bring out the appropriate behaviors and the supports that we need to have in place for that student to be successful. And then if a behavior problem does develop, just like other kids in school, we want to have a functional behavior analysis completed so we can figure out what are the triggers in setting off those problems. And then following that, develop a management plan which diffuses any potential crisis situations before they can escalate. As mentioned earlier, there are common emotions after concussion. We have several of them listed here. And also I want to just briefly go over the physical symptoms again, including headache or pressure in the head, nausea and vomiting, balance problems or dizziness, and that might um, arise from injury to the vestibular or balance system. Lots of fatigue or feeling tired, blurry or double vision, sensitivity to light and or noise, numbness or tingling, and just not feeling right in general when it comes to thinking. And again, I wanted to stress that kids with concussions typically appear well physically and you can't see it. Now I wanted to have you listen as Isaiah talks about some of his frustrations. The thing that frustrated me at school was my blind spots because, it's like, and also my slow, like writing speed. It's like first off, it's like, like, like they were writing, and I hadn't really, uh, like, uh, gotten used to my blind spots yet. So they were writing, and I was, I was like, I just say a few words, and and then I went. I, I, when my, when I got better with my eyes, it's like, like me writing down the same stuff because they're writing on the, on the, the whiteboard. It's like I couldn't write it that fast so I, because I write something and I go on to the next thing and I'd still be writing the thing down. This is Scott again. Um, we wanted to, to also talk about uh, how brain injury um, interfaces with ongoing child development because that's a, a particularly big issue given that injuries can occur at any age but there's certainly uh, developmental straight stages where an injury can have different kinds of effects and one of the things we need to keep in mind is that um, the abilities that are emerging at the time of an injury are the most vulnerable to disruption um, we can also see delays in the consequences of an injury so a, a child at a very young age may get it a blow to the head and it's only when uh, some of those higher level organizing and and reasoning skills that are needed in adolescence and beyond uh, only when they start to be needed does it become clear that uh, the the child is still having some effects from that earlier injury now this doesn't happen as often with concussions but it does happen um, so it's not something we can completely ignore um, physical injuries may heal quickly and uh, that sometimes um, gives us the feeling that nothing serious has, has gone on, but uh, the developing brain can be altered and have serious consequences. I want to show a, a quote here, I'll read it off to you, you can read it if you're following along, um, just how development and, and brain injury interface. Uh, this is from um, Mark Ilvesacker and, and his group. Um, the younger the child, the more profound the long-term effects of brain injury may be, particularly in the areas of behavioral self-regulation and learning. When a brain injury occurs, information previously learned is often retained. 
younger children, particularly preschool children, do not have the same knowledge base to build upon and may experience great difficulty mastering new skills. So if they haven't already built up a, a good uh, learning base to, to go off of, they may have trouble uh, compensating when, uh, when some additional learning is expected. I'm going to go rather quickly through some of the things that we see at, at kids at different stages. And, and you, you have this information in the, in the PDF that was a handout for the, for the talk today. So I'm not going to uh, spend a lot of detail on this, but um, just to give you some sense. And there's some overlap, obviously. Uh, brain injuries can cause some similar problems at, at, across the age span. But when you, when you see very young kids with, with an injury, uh, often problems that, that show up are problems with self-regulation and language, impulse control, and, and being able to handle transitions flexibly. Uh, when the kids are a little older, three to six, um, you can start to see more problems in learning from consequences of behavior. Uh, organization can be affected, uh, difficulties dealing with change, uh, and, and even possible aggressive behavior in tantrums, especially if kids are put in situations they are struggling to manage. And uh, learning of, of even early preschool concepts can, can be impaired if it's a significant trauma. In kids a little older, 6 to 12, uh, academic difficulties can, can um, uh, turn out to be uh, more significant problems than were evident earlier. Uh, the academic profile may be uneven, so some skills that look pretty good and other skills that look pretty um, weak. Uh, organization uh, continues to be a question, especially as the demands get greater for organization. Uh, flexibility problems are often there. Uh, frustration tolerance can be limited and social judgment uh, may be impaired as well. For kids between 12 and 16, things are starting to get a little more abstract, so uh, you can see problems with, with abstract concepts. Judgment and reasoning, those are often difficulties in kids injured at this age. Um, reduced the ability to assume responsibilities, uh, dependence on others uh, is, is often there in order for them to function, and uh, difficulty managing larger academic demands or big projects and, and things where they have to put a lot of pieces together over time. And social demands may also be exceeding their ability to, to tolerate what's going on socially. And for the older adolescents, um, there may be some rigidity in thinking, often necessary in order to uh, have enough structure in the way you're living your life and thinking about school to be able to handle the day-to-day -day demands. Uh, you may not be as flexible, so you, you need to, to have more uh, rigid uh, uh, approaches to things. Uh, mental processing is often slow. Um, difficulty with um, uh, your self-image, being insecure about that, defensiveness regarding the deficits, because you certainly don't want to be reminded that you have some kind of a problem or look different in any way. And there can be significant interference as you move into young adulthood with being able to be fully independent uh, if you've got some ongoing uh, disabilities that are still present. Now, it's, it's also important to think about what we can do when those problems develop. It's one thing to just mention some of the difficulties that show up, but we actually would like to do something about them, and, and we can. There are lots of accommodations that can support kids and keep them moving forward and really result in, in pretty good outcomes. So, um, you know, we know that students may struggle with keeping up with schoolwork, we, so it's important to focus on that as even if they aren't raising it as a question themselves. We need to discuss any concern with the student and they need to be provided with accommodations and emotional support while they're experiencing any of the complications from a concussion. And it may help to remind the students uh, that most concussions don't result in serious long-term problems, even though they, they may be feeling that, that you know, this is never going to end, they're never going to be able to get back to what they were doing. Um, it, it also is good to remind students that uh, the, some of the special services or accommodations that they may need to recover from a concussion can be removed gradually as they, as they begin to feel better and learn better. And so it, it, it isn't a, a life sentence to uh, a changed life for most kids with concussions. And, and, and I think it's sometimes important to support students in understanding that. 
The goals during recovery are generally these, avoid overexerting the brain um, to the level that things, uh, uh, the symptoms are made worse or, or uh, they're, they're starting up again. Um, avoiding a second blow to the head is really critical because if uh, you get additional blows before the initial concussion has healed, the brain is at even greater risk for long-term problems. It's really a challenge to determine the proper balance uh, between how much cognitive exertion and how much cognitive rest is needed um, during a recovery. Uh, that, that is really a balancing act that depends on trying some things out, trying to challenge the, the student, but also reassessing progress and looking at whether symptoms are reoccurring um, very frequently. And one of the ways to do that uh, may be to uh, get a, a formal neuropsychological evaluation completed if the symptoms or cognitive problems don't resolve pretty quickly, and also to track symptoms with checklists or, or other uh, you know, simple devices to be able to use them frequently and, and uh, uh, try to keep up with where a, a student is at in terms of recovery. Here's here just, uh, I'm not going to go through each of the, these items, but um, just for your reference, you may want to look at these. These are some of the things that uh, an elementary age student into middle school may, may be able to track for themselves or let you know how much these, are, these kinds of things are problems. And some of them are cognitive uh, symptoms and some of them are physical symptoms. And then here's a, a similar uh, list for uh, kids uh, who are in middle school through high school. And, and again, it's, it's a mix of physical symptoms and, and some of the emotional and, and cognitive uh, confusion symptoms that are frequently uh, there after concussion. Just thinking a little bit more about cognitive rest, we, we heard about it from Dr. Mike in the video, but just think about it, um, you know, if a student can only concentrate for less than 30 minutes, it's going to be pretty hard to function at school, so it probably makes sense to stay at home until uh, the student is able to handle a little bit longer period of time without rest. Um, if they're able to focus and tolerate symptoms comfortably for at least 30 to 45 minutes, then I think uh, it's reasonable to consider a return to school part-time. And These cutoffs are somewhat arbitrary, but, but they are based on, on observations that a good amount of learning can occur in those kinds of 30 to 45 minute uh, chunks. And so I think, it's, I think those are reasonable ways to, to help guide your, your return to learn. Um, and make sure that, that the individual student is, is doing fine before you move to a, a more demanding level of expectations. You know, some of the things that you can do for a, a, a student after concussion really can vary. Uh, they can be um, just individualized adjustments. So, uh, you know, we know that most students who've had a concussion are significantly better and pretty much back to normal within a few weeks. And so you may just need to do some additional uh, initial adjustments with schedule or, or work demands. Um, if you need to go more formal than that, you can put in place a, a 504 accommodation plan, and you can actually specify that certain kinds of uh, standardized tests may need to be avoided or at least extra time to complete tests or complete work, and that uh, changes in the class schedule may be helpful in, in helping a, a kid who is is still struggling to uh, kind of get back to baseline. Um, there's also uh, the possibility if, if problems are, are more long term, um, that an individualized educational plan can be put together if we're uh, seeing more permanent changes that require that kind of uh, attention. So you can, you can intervene at, at varying levels of, of uh, aggressiveness or complexity depending on what the student's needs are. The other thing that really is important, and, and I think we're, we're seeing this now as a best practice, and there's, there's uh, good evidence that this results in, in um, the best outcomes for kids who are uh, experiencing concussions, is to, to form a, a, a school-based concussion management team. Uh, and, and I think it's going to be important moving forward also because of the, uh, the issues for um, the potential for legal action if concussions are not well managed, and this is something that that most schools can put together, even if they don't have you know extensive formal training. 
they can at least get leadership from a school nurse who's serving that school, can pull together uh, uh, students and family to make sure accommodations are working and that, that symptoms are under control. And uh, school staff need to be involved as well. Some worry about the, the academic demands based on what the teachers are seeing. Um, also, the athletic coaches or trainers being uh, needing to be involved to make sure that return to play is, is uh, following uh, the guidelines for being very careful to, to start with very limited uh, activities and really not to return to play until the, uh, um, the return to learn issues have been resolved. And then administrative support is critical um, from um, principals or other uh, administrators at the, at the school uh, in, in terms of being able to uh, provide for kids uh, the, the, the integrated management that a team can provide. I'm going to turn it over to Val to talk, uh, really follow up on, on some of these issues in terms of uh, returning to learn uh, and, and some of the issues that we need to uh, use as strategies to, to help kids. Thanks, Scott. And before I talk about the strategies more in detail, I just wanted to remind everybody that we really want you to remember that every concussion is different, every kiddo is different, and so interventions must be individualized if they're going to be effective for that student. The gradual return to full learning and uh, full learning and full workload is best, and keeping in mind that one of the key things to look for is if problems or symptoms reemerge, then we need to decrease task demands at the same time we're increasing supports for the student. Now I'm going to go through strategies a little more in detail. And as Scott mentioned, rest breaks are important and spending fewer hours at school is, is one way to shorten the number of hours that the kiddo is cognitively involved in academics. A lot of times for kids, giving them half of the, their normal workload is helpful for them. Giving them more time to take tests and finish assignments is helpful. And giving them instruction in smaller chunks. And I was thinking about how that would be easier at the elementary level, a little more difficult at the high school level for teachers to be able to make that change. Students may need help with their schoolwork and it's best if we can help them reduce the time that they spend on the computer, reading, or writing. It's important to determine which classes are tolerated best. That might be due to the content of the course as well as the time of day that it is offered. Choose adjustments that are amenable to the teacher's teaching style and their content along with what phase of recovery the student is in. And if instruction is missed, the student may need to get class notes and that can be particularly helpful if the student has vestibular problems and has difficulties that are triggered by moving the eyes up and down from the teacher back down to the notes. Supplemental tutoring also is great for kids, as well as easing assignments or course expectations. For some kids, it really is great for them if you can let them out of class early so they can go through the halls without a lot of the bustle and noise and stimulation in the hallways. If they're having difficulty with sensitivity to light, let them wear sunglasses or a hat or sit in an area where it's not so bright. If the hustle and bustle of the hallways bugs them, the hustle and bustle in the lunch area may also be problematic for them. So you might need to give them a quiet place to have lunch and again to take tests. For some kids, extracurricular activities are still possible as long as they're not overdoing it physically. Students may benefit from having a peer work with them and we recommend repeating directions but we don't want to bombard the student with repetitious schoolwork. We don't want them to be um, given busy work that is going to deplete that energy in their battery. 
It's helpful if all teachers use the same kind of strategies with the student, and these all should be discussed with the family, of course, as we talk about that team approach. The family members are a key part of that team, as Scott was saying. These are some strategies that I took from Brain Steps, which is a program that comes out of Pennsylvania, and they talk about alleviating brain fatigue by using these different strategies and a lot of these are based in the idea that the students executive functions will not be working as well so you can give them checklists so that they keep things um, in order and know when they're done and need to move on to the next thing task analysis lists, graphic organizers those can be for a lot of different things including written assignments Schedules, fact sheets, using multiple choice and open book tests, allowing them to have word banks, particularly if they're having word finding difficulties, allow them to just circle an answer, and even giving them the page number in the book where the answer can be found. So we want to work to prevent long-term problems, and as we've been saying, most students are going to recover quickly, but we really want to make sure that they are not in a situation where they can have a repeat concussion before the brain is fully recovered because in some cases that repeated concussion can result in brain swelling, permanent brain damage, and even death. But to end that on a lighter note, we have to remember that kids usually will be recovering in one to three weeks. Now I wanted to share a personal story. I thought that Dr. Mike's analogy of the brain being a battery with a low charge is a good description of how I felt after I fell in mid-July and I suffered a concussion. I was slow at everything, walking, talking, and I've always talked slowly, but you wouldn't have believed how slowly I talked then. The mental and physical fatigue led me to sleeping at first 20 out of 24 hours in a day. I didn't experience emotions like we were talking about, I didn't experience emotions literally. I felt dull inside, which helped in some ways because when we had a tornado warning, it was the first time in my life I didn't spaz out. I experienced a lot of surprises during this process too, following the concussion. I was amazed at how much it hurt and just how many different triggers there were to the pain. Triggers were things like thinking, bright lights, flashing lights were really bad, trying to look back and forth between people during a conversation and riding in a car, which is still really tough. Getting through a day without the executive functions that we've been talking about of planning and following steps to reach a goal meant that when I opened the refrigerator door, I couldn't figure out what to do. My husband fortunately did figure out what to do and his accommodations for me included leaving stickums for me with instructions on open the left door, top left shelf, scrambled eggs, microwave for 30 seconds. So that's the ex and that I think is a good example to show just how my executive functioning was totally depleted. And just like Students who have a concussion, I was frustrated by making steps forward only to experience an unexpected trigger and then my symptoms would come back and I'd lose a lot of ground. I knew taking breaks were important, but one of the frustrating things, I've talked to Scott about this, it was just really difficult to figure out when I needed to take breaks, for how long I needed them. Um, at first it was easy because I was sleepy all the time, but as I started recovering more, it was just really frustrating and, and now I'm only working every other day with a full day of recovery in between, so that may be something that's helpful for kids in the school too. Um, I've learned a lot about what injury to the vestibular system impacts in your day-to-day -day, um, activities, including motion sickness, not only riding in a car, and think about how that would Im impact teenagers, but also just moving my eyes back and forth during meals or taking notes during clinic interviews. And there are just so many things that didn't make sense to me, like we're talking about eye movements triggering symptoms, but I could go down to the garden and pick beans and move my eyes around and it didn't bother me at all. So there are a lot of things like that that were just really um, confusing to me. 
So I learned firsthand that the concussion experience, like other brain injuries, is different for everyone, and it does take it takes time. And now progress for me is measured in silly little things, like I can tolerate going into Lowe's to go shopping. I still can't handle high V because there's just too much stimulation and bright lights. Um, another progress marker for me is that I can still beat my husband at Scrabble. So the progress that I've had is measured in, in subtle ways now, um, as I'm now nearly five months post-concussion. Um, and my progress has been helped by medications that reduce the headaches and wearing special sunglasses outside or sometimes even inside when I'm in fluorescent lights. Scott and I are sitting here in a room that's not very bright right now, so I can get through this. So I am happy to report, though, that charging my brain battery and keeping it charged is getting better all the time. Great. Thanks, Val. I appreciate your willingness to share that. Thank you. I'm just going to, real quickly, we're, we have just a few minutes left, but I want to summarize a few things. And we've got, in the, in the handout, there are lots of resources, so I'm not going to talk about each one of them because you can take a look at those. But we've done, I think, a, a pretty good job of going through some of the things available online and trying to highlight ones you may find helpful. Um, but one of the things I wanted to remind everybody about, and, and those of you who know something about concussion already know about this, but uh, Iowa does have a law that requires that all the athletes, at least seventh grade and beyond, and their parents need to sign a, a fact sheet on concussions uh, before they participate in any sports or cheerleading or dance. And, and an athlete must be removed from participation if the coach or an official observes signs, symptoms, or behaviors consistent with a concussion and the athlete may not return to participation until receiving an evaluation and written clearance from a health professional. So those, those are issues that must guide our return to play and probably could even be um, more stringent or apply to more kids because these don't include club sports or younger kids or any, any of those kinds of uh, situations. But they, they do represent a very important part in making sure kids are safe and that uh, concussions don't result in long-term injuries. Um, some other strategies we need to think about as we think about returning to play after concussion is that uh, we really want to see them performing at an academic baseline before they're returning to sports, uh, full, ac full physical activities or other extracurricular activities. Um, I think that's important because uh, if they're not back to academic baseline, it means they're still showing symptoms uh, of a concussion, at least in the cognitive end, and they're usually other uh, emotional or physical symptoms or mood symptoms that may also be present, and it doesn't make sense to, to um, add brain risk at the time when you still haven't recovered. Um, there's also an importance to following a systematic series of steps to guide recovery, and I think you saw a good example of that in, in what Dr. Mike talked about in his video. Um, the other thing is that um, just, the, you know, we've been talking about this throughout the session. When a student has a concussion, we need to give the brain time to heal, and that's the important thing, and we're looking at the symptoms as a way of telling us how far the brain has healed, how much they've returned to baseline. And um, the student needs to limit their activities while they're recovering, and as I mentioned, um, it's a, you have to get a, uh, an, an evaluation and sign off from a, a healthcare professional before you return to play. So what that means is uh, no kid who's had a concussion should be returned to sports or even recreation activities on the same day of the injury. So that's an easy rule to think about. Um, I mentioned that they had to, to get uh, a sign off from a healthcare professional. And um, one of the ways you can figure out if you're still having problems is if exercise induces uh, increased symptoms, you know, headache, fatigue, fatigue, those kinds of things. And so that means you may need to back off a little bit. These are some er ways to look more uh, closely at some of the issues that may help you think about returning to play. Impact is a system of computerized testing that, that uh, can be done at baseline and then after an injury to see if uh, students are back to baseline. A lot of uh, the larger high schools in the state use Impact. The NFL uses Impact. 
but there's also um, there are sideline assessment tools like SCAT, uh, which can help you look at whether or not symptoms are showing up uh, right after concussion, and and those don't require a computer to to do testing. Um, there's also good information in Brain 101, which is from our our colleagues in Oregon about uh, concussions and return to play. So those are a couple of the resources we really recommend you look at about return to play strategies. The CDC also has really good information about concussions and they just put out a, a recent um, uh, uh, set of, of information that uh, was based on some data where they looked at um, how many athletes admitted to playing with con concussion symptoms and 69%, more than two thirds of athletes said that they had played with concussion symptoms. So this is, this is something where we need to, to educate everybody involved to make sure that uh, we, we don't uh, harm kids. And we also have already mentioned the importance of school-based teams. That's something the CDC stresses and there's additional information on that website. I'm, I'm just going to talk about one other area that I think is really important, and that's who else can help when you have problems. And um, one of the things that we know is the area education agencies have teams that can help. There's a brain injury resource team, a challenging behavior team, and the special education consultants can all be of help depending on the needs. Um, in the school, we hope that each school will eventually develop its own brain injury management team. Uh, that's the hope for the future and part of what we're looking at in our current HRSA project. Um, also, there's a coordinator of accommodations through the 504 plans. Uh, that can be someone at school can help. And, and medical staff and neuropsychologists and other therapists can, can also help with, with some of the cognitive and, and medical needs. If you need some help about a case, just consultation about the case. Both Val and I are available to provide that. Just, just uh, send us an, an email and we'll, we'll try to respond within a day or so. Uh, so that's another place you can get some consultation about these issues. Uh, I'm just going to skim through these. You've got all of these in your handouts. These are resources you may find useful. I know we do. Um, and um, I was, if we had time, which we don't, I was going to show you one other brief video. Take a look at this yourself. It's something put out by the CDC. The link to YouTube for, the, for Tracy's story is right there. It's about a young athlete who's had a couple of concussions and, and didn't uh, attend to them right away and, and experienced some additional problems because of it. Uh, meanwhile, uh, keep this in mind, it's a picture that uh, Val took. Um, with the right support, students with concussion will be back zipping through school in no time. And that, that's certainly true. That's not just... Uh, uh, being overly optimistic. If, if concussions are well managed, it may take a little while, but um, the vast majority will return to uh, good functioning within several months. And we have uh, a minute or two for questions, so I, I don't know if, uh, if Melissa, if you have anything uh, uh, that you want to ask us from what's come in uh, from the online yeah. questions. We, greatly, thank you so much, you guys, for uh, providing some insight into on this topic for us here today. Um, we do have a couple of questions. Um, one of the questions we have here, you mentioned earlier that there was a functional behavioral an analysis. Who would go about completing this analysis, and where does a professional in the school setting go um, to request one of these for a student? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, that, that can be done by most of the challenging behavior teams in each, there's a team in almost every area education agency. So if you need help with functional analysis, there, there are teams that can do that. It's also something that, that some of our colleagues here at the Children's Hospital uh, can do, but it's, it's, it's something that um, should be able to be done uh, by the AEA uh, staff if you if you get to the right staff. You may have to tell them that you know exactly what you're looking for because they're they're not. We've done some work in in uh, sensitizing them to the issues that come up after brain injury, but there's they're still mainly focused on dealing with um, more severely impaired kids who may have broader developmental disabilities. So this is a new area for them, but I think they're excited about getting into it more. 
Good deal. Thank you for that response. Um, another question here, who do you think um, of the school professionals, who should one speak to at the school about a return to learn plan if they don't already have a concussion or traumatic brain injury team set up? Yeah, I think certainly we, we've gotten um, good interest from school nurses, and I, I think that that's part of their, obviously, nurses do a lot of things and they're stretched pretty thin. They, they don't always have a single one at each school. They may have to cover many schools. But I, I would say talk to the school nurse. They, they know that this is something that, that needs to uh, be developed in a lot of the schools. And so I would start with them. It, it's also something that starting with the school principal may be um, a way to get some administrative buy-in to, to make this happen. Um, usually there's some people at, the, at each school who know something about concussion. It may sometimes be a teacher, maybe a coach, maybe a trainer, maybe an administrator, um, but certainly the, the nurses uh, are probably the, the, the best uh, professionals to take the lead on that. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I think that that's all the questions I have here right now. I'm not seeing any other questions pop up. Um, I guess I would just like to remind um, anybody who's listening on this webinar here today, uh, you're always welcome to also contact the Brain Injury Alliance of Iowa with questions. Uh, we do have our website. We have um, our hotline phone number and email as well if anybody would like to contact us directly um, to help get you connected to the appropriate professional. So um, otherwise, I guess I'd like to go ahead and thank everybody for participating in the webinar here today. Uh, just a couple more housekeeping items. Uh, the certificate of attendance will be sent out later today, and there is a survey link um, on the email that we'll be sending out. So we do ask that you take some time to complete that for us. Um, otherwise, this recording will be available on our website again here in the next couple days. So um, otherwise, that will go ahead and conclude our webinar. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.